Welcome. Everything is pointless? You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode 5, Jeremy Baramy. It was written by Megan Amram, directed by Trent O'Donnell. Oh, it's Trent. You take out the T, it's Rent. You take out the R, it's Tent. It's an easy way to remember it, you know? And it aired October 18th, 2018. We're recording this a little later than normal, and yeah. the the new episode is out, but we have not watched it. We don't want to get spoiled for our thoughts and our analysis, so... All right, should we get right into it? Dive right in. The four humans confront Michael and Janet. Michael tries to convince them that they're FBI agents, but he quickly gives up on that plan. They explain the afterlife to the four humans, including how time moves non-linearly in a Jeremy Baramy pattern. Michael explains that their knowledge of the afterlife has corrupted them, and they are now unable to earn their spot in the good place. They're all doomed. Thanks, Michael. Way to go. No, mm. honestly, I was so worried as soon as Michael was like, we're from the FBI. I was so scared that they were going to do that again this whole episode. They mm. were just going to try and... Oh, no, that plan wasn't good from the beginning. That no. was bad. Special Agent Rick Justice? Are Jason, you kidding me? Jason would buy it. Yeah, but everybody else? And Lisa Frenchy Fuqua? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. And then he messes up and calls her Janet immediately? That wasn't going to go well. My friend Garrett mentioned to me that this nickname is actually a reference to uh, like a sports thing, which makes sense with Michael Schur's love of sports, I guess. Um, John Frenchy Fuqua was actually a running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1970s. Oh, wow. And apparently he was a key figure in the Immaculate Reception. I didn't know that was a thing. I know very, very little about sports, but I guess... I love the name. Yeah, I guess that happened. So just a little like subtle thing out there for sports fans. So you're glad that it didn't go in that direction. We didn't do another episode where Michael's just trying to fool them and nothing progresses. So glad. Mm -hmm. I, I really like this. I really like this episode. Like, I thought it was great. It's probably my, well, no, it's definitely my favorite of the season. Um, but it might be up there in, like, the top five of, like, ever mm -hmm. episodes. Um, High praise. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great episode. Way to go, Megan Amram. I just really like how ridiculous the idea is of Jeremy Baramy and the whole timeline thing. I It's just completely out there. Like, I think whoever came up with that idea should win an Emmy. You know, like hashtag an Emmy for Megan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Megan. Didn't quite work out for you, but maybe next time. Yeah, maybe you'll get one for this episode. It just, the the whole idea of Jeremy Baramy, I like it, but it just seemed to be pandering to the viewers. Like, mm. there's so many people that were trying to figure out how the timeline worked and did time move and... Like us. Like, yeah. People it, like us. Exactly. <laughs> and it just didn't feel like it needed to be explained. Okay. But yeah. I, I kind of get it. Like, I like it and I like all the, the people mm. from Doctor Who who are comparing that to the the timey-wimey wibbly wobbly whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you just feel like it's it's not good like it's not a good enough explanation it's a good explanation but it okay. wasn't needed uh, okay. i don't think we need it i don't think it adds anything to the show mm, okay that's fair it's it's definitely influenced by fans then mm -hmm. okay i feel like it just adds even more confusion about the afterlife. Like, we can't possibly understand it. And when Michael says to Chidi, no, you get it, right? Like, you get it. No, he doesn't get it because human brains don't comprehend that stuff. Right. Um, and also, like, <laughs> from everything that we've seen in the afterlife so far, in the bad place and in the in the judge's office and everything, yeah. time has moved pretty linearly. Yeah. So no, There's nothing confusing about what we've seen so far so it just doesn't seem to matter and dedicating a whole episode title to like a two minute bit it just mm. seems like a waste oh okay what would you have named this episode 
I don't know, Chidi's Broken? Chidi's Chili Crisis? Yeah, Chidi's <laughs> Chili Crisis. I like that. <laughs> but that would have been a spoiler. Jeremy Barramy is just, if you don't know what it is, it's just a title. I, know you're I thinking, thought it was going to oh, be a person. a person, right. Well, yeah. I I like it. I feel like it's the right amount of nonsensical. I don't think we could make sense of it if we tried, which I actually like because it sort of takes the pressure off. And I understand why that's what breaks Cheaty. Mm-hmm. Um, the dot over the eye described as Tuesdays, July, sometimes never. And the time moment when nothing occurs, it's just not something that we can comprehend. Right. It's like the fourth or fifth or sixth dimension. Yeah. It's just... There's all these moments in Jeremy Bear Me that intersect. So now it makes me wonder, are two moments happening simultaneously? And then if everything loops back, does that mean that it just happens over and over and over again the same way? Or does it re-record itself? Mm -hmm. There are questions. I still have questions. But at the same time, I know that they're not going to get answered. I just enjoy having them. Is that weird? I don't know. It just seemed like a nonsense answer Yeah, I'm... that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. I don't know. It just almost seems like if anybody ever have, has any questions in the future about the whole timeline, they'll just say, eh, Jeremy, bear me. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Honestly, I'm fine with it. I thought it was a really good joke. I love that it broke Cheaty. So back in season two, we were talking a lot about the timeline, right? Because we were thinking about how long have they been in the bad place with all these reboots. And in season two, episode four, Team Cockroach, we actually see a bit of a graph. And one of our listeners, Anya, at Strangely Literal, digitized a graph to try to calculate the time that the core four had spent in the bad place. Yeah, I remember discussing that. Yeah, and she estimated about 350 years. So she wasn't far off. Pretty Because he said almost 300. And in that same episode, this part, I feel like, is a bit of contradictory to the Jeremy Barramy Michael says he can't predict the future, so he doesn't really exist outside of time. And like you were saying earlier, like everything we've seen so far is linear. So maybe we're only seeing a teeny tiny section of Jeremy Barry, right? You're like sure. just at the top of the J or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe this Jeremy Barry actually lasts for millions of years. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Just thought it was interesting. What did you think of everyone's immediate reaction? One of the things I would have preferred to see was their reactions a bit more fleshed out. Mm. To see their reactions of, hey, you guys died. You've lived hundreds of years together, getting rebooted hundreds of times. Yeah. And we only get like a fraction of that. I feel like we do get somewhat of a reaction. Like we obviously get Chidi's reaction. That's the biggest one where we can see that all of this is way too overwhelming for him which i think is perfect and eleanor's feels right like she's pessimistic she's angry but she's also a little bit relieved i feel like that's kind of perfect but the one that surprises me the most is tahani she's kind of quiet she doesn't ask to speak to the manager or try to argue her way out of this and say that it's unfair and we need to talk to somebody because i can't possibly go to hell and you know, wear knockoff designer handbags and drink tap water. Like, she's quiet. She accepts it. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre, but I feel like it's growth. And then Jason is quiet. We don't even get like a, oh man, what a bummer. But maybe that's a sign of growth for him too. So let's move along. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through sort of each individual story and talk about them one at a time. So we'll start with Michael and Janet. Michael and Janet write a manifesto, planning to turn themselves into the judge and deliver their recommendations on how to improve the system of the afterlife. Okay, so I like that these two take a bit of a backseat in this episode. I think it's nice to spend more time with our humans, because obviously their reactions are more important, I think, in this episode. Yeah, it's more important to see what, uh, what everyone ends up doing with this newfound information. Yeah. And I like that Michael's accepted it. Finally, he's he's at that point to say we failed, but maybe someday someone else will succeed and that's okay with him. And I think it's interesting that they're talking about their suggestions for improvements. I like that. 
that's what we've been talking about this entire podcast is how the afterlife system is completely unfair. So it's nice to see that Michael and Janet are taking a... Initiative? Yeah, are taking initiative. I like that. Yeah, it seems like Janet is definitely the being or person, not a person, Yeah. <laughs> to take this initiative with her newfound knowledge and all of her experiences. If Michael does get retired, mm-hmm. then maybe maybe the the whole system or the judge or anyone would actually would actually take a Janet in this case to find out everything that she know, knows or learned in this situation because she would be uh, uh, an unbiased third party. Yeah, she'd be a valuable asset for sure, sure. Absolutely. And it's interesting because they offer a different perspective. They've actually spent a chunk of time on Earth. They know what life is like there and they understand in a different way, right? Like. If you're a demon and all you've ever had is your job, um, you don't have relationships, you don't have anything else in your life, you've never been on Earth, then how can you really put yourself in the shoes of a human being? Right. Especially if you're a demon and all you've ever known about humans are the bad humans. Yeah. Another thing I just thought of is maybe Sean wanted to marbleize Janet so badly because she was a threat to him and the whole system. Oh, I like that. Sean's thinking ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe he's a little smarter than we imagine he is. Maybe he's realizing that she was getting more powerful. Mm. I'm missing Mark Evan Jackson a little bit. Like, I I do love Sean. I, I'm getting my dose of him with the, uh, the Good Place, the podcast, but still, it'd be nice to get a little more afterlife up in here. Maybe a bit better storyline for him. Yeah, yeah, not just chasing after the humans. I actually heard on that podcast um, that a lot of Michael and Janet's story was cut. Apparently, this was the longest episode they've had so far, and the extended episode is going to be the longest, clocking in at 26 minutes instead of 21. Mm. So five extra minutes of content. So when those extended episodes drop, you better go check it out, guys. Yeah, we We can't wait to see those extended (laughs) episodes. Mm Mm-hmm. So another little thing, I saw something on Reddit that intrigued me. Um, A user called the Schmohawk22 had a theory that the show that we're watching right now is the manifesto since every episode is a different chapter, which I thought was a cool idea. Yeah, it's an interesting theory. Yeah. And really, if they're laying things out, that's pretty much right. I like that. Plus... The judge does tend to binge TV shows, so maybe this will be the right format to really, to really get her and and help her understand. Did you have anxiety while you were watching Michael try to type? Oh my gosh, a little (laughs) bit. Yeah, it was it was a good joke. I did like seeing Janet so uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. and it's very reminiscent of every grandparent I've ever had trying to write me an email. Or so, search the internet or uh, use a computer, no. period. No, no, it's, it's just so bad. Apparently, that's slightly modeled after how Ted uses the computer. Oh, so. that's sad. So it, now I just wonder how long it takes him to compose his tweets. <laughs> or if he has someone else do them for him. He's got his own Janet. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that the typeface that they're using, it was called Liberation Serif. Oh, cute. Even though clearly it was a sans serif font. Oh my god, the designer in you. (laughs) But it was likely Liberation sans serif, but it is an actual font. Yeah. Just a little tidbit there. Tahani gives $2 million anonymously to the Sydney Opera House. Jason then leads her to distribute money to people they think need it. She decides that Jason is one of those people and tries to transfer all her money to him. The bank won't allow her, so she marries Jason in order to give him half her wealth. So I like Tahani in this episode. I think it's great. I actually think it's a really good episode for her. I feel like I'm seeing some positive growth, and I was very pleased. I like that she doesn't try to fight fate, like I was saying before with, you know, she's not trying to speak to the manager. Buy her way into the good place. Yeah, she just accepts it and chooses to still do good on Earth. Because I feel like this information was freeing for her. She knows she can't earn any more points. And she was always trying to earn praise from 
family, uh, you know, other celebrities, all that. And she says it best, right? I've always been held captive by my desire for attention. And of course, she never got that attention from her parents. So it's nice for her to just feel free to do good things for the sake of doing them. I like that. I think it's really mature of her. I like that Jason and Tahani have teamed up together for this episode. They're very, they're very good together. I always like them. And the fact that she tries to name drop around Jason (laughs) is kind of funny because I doubt Jason uh, has seen the bodyguard. (laughs) Oh, I love that. And now every time I think of the word bodyguard, I think of how Tahani pronounces that word. The bodyguard. (laughs) (laughs) And the the scene in the Sydney Opera House, Tahani is sparkling. Mm. Like, if you look at her shoulders and her face and her chest, like, she's literally sparkling. It looks like they've used glitter body spray or something on her. Oh, probably, yeah. It's quite fascinating. Hmm. And, of course, Jason calling Megan Amram's violin a chin guitar. That was great. Yep. And nice to see Megan Amram in an episode, too. Yeah, get a little cameo. And that was actually her playing violin. So it sounds like something that the the 10 guy that meme would say. Oh, right, right. Like, yo, dude, your mom is really good at playing the chin guitar. (laughs) Yeah, the super high guy. Yeah. I did a little conversion for the the amount of money that Tani has. Oh, I did too. Excellent. (laughs) So how much is 131 million British pounds in Canadian dollars? 220 million. Oh. And US? 169. Huh. So I just want to go back to Tahani for just a second. Like I was saying that I'm proud of her. She's being virtuous for virtue's sake. I just, I really love it. I feel like she's finally able to live life for herself. I don't know, like her status, her wealth, her family, all these things made her feel like she was obligated to do something that the public would approve of. Kind of like if you're if you're famous or if you're uh, royalty, right? So like Prince Harry's not going to be like, well, I'm going to stay in my basement for a week and play Xbox because that's what I feel like doing. Right. When you have because this it's status. Prince Harry and you need to be doing like humanitarian stuff. Right. You feel whatever. obligated. Yeah, exactly. Because you have the means. Yeah. You, and you have the means and you have that pressure from your family and that pressure from society to use your wealth, your status as an advantage um, to better the world, right? Sure. Which it's not like this awful, horrible thing, but it also means that you can't really live life the way you want to live it. So now Tahani finally has that chance because she already knows I'm going to the bad place when I die. That's just what's going to happen. So really, why don't I just live in a way that is going to do good in the world and make me happy and make other people happy? And that's all I need to worry about. Like, I don't need to try and impress my parents or anything because none of that worked out for me. Mm -hmm. I was always trying to do that before. You know, I was always trying to live up to other people's expectations and it landed me in the bad place. So why do it again? And she comes up with the idea herself to give her money to Jason. Yeah, she doesn't. And to give the money to Sydney Opera House, like she doesn't ask Michael what she should do to try her earn her way in. Mm -hmm. Like. I'm so proud of Tahani in this episode. I love her right now. She's doing so good. Team Tahani. Yeah. Hashtag Tahani time. <laughs> yeah. And then Jason come up comes up with, you know, the idea to give it to just random people on the street, which is nice too. Personally, I would just give it to a charity that can properly like organize and distribute that money. But I get it. Like there's a very different sense in actually giving the money yourself, seeing that smiling face, seeing how you've made that person happier. Right. Yeah. I mean, then you're getting into maybe selfish territory. Mm. So, no, I I get doing it yourself because that's instant. Like, you don't have to go through a system to actually, you don't know how long it's going to take for that to have a direct impact on Joe Blow on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. It might not ever get to him. He might not ever go to the shelter or whatever. So giving it directly to them, they feel like they're having a direct impact on that one specific person. Yeah. (laughs) And I like the fact that they were not giving the money to just homeless people or people obviously in need. Like they gave it to a mom and like just random people on the street. Yeah. Madam, are you poor? 
<laughs> Remember, you don't have to ask them that. Oh, I love it. And Jason is trying to teach Tahani to be a little bit less judgmental, maybe. Yeah. So that's nice, too. I'm a little sad that we don't really get a whole lot of reaction from Jason in this episode. Like, he clearly accepts it to the extent that he can understand what's going on. And he's not deciding to be an idiot because he can, like Eleanor. He's doing a good thing. I just feel like it's the Tawny train and he's the passenger. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, we don't really get a Jason reaction of, I died. Yeah. But perhaps that's coming. I'm hopeful that it will. I know next week's episode is called The Ballad of Donkey Doug, so maybe there's a Jason-centric. Yeah, that's promising. That's good. All right. Shall we go to our next human? Eleanor is relieved she can return to her old ways. She drinks at a bar and attempts to return to being a bad person, but is unwilling to steal money from a wallet she finds. Instead, she goes to great lengths to return it to its owner. Oh, Eleanor, I was so disappointed with you at the start of this episode. I mean... Disappointment didn't last long. No, it didn't. And... I could sense that it wasn't a, it wasn't like a relief, like, oh, okay, good. I got, I can take off this mask of a good person, right? I could tell it was out of anger and mm -hmm. sadness, right? So I knew it was going to crumble quickly, but I was still like, oh, come on, Eleanor, come on, you're so close. And then, and then she wouldn't take the money. So that was good. She has these breakthroughs at bars. Yeah, she really does. <laughs> Talking to bartenders, like, does something to her. Yep. They're her therapist. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I Don't take that as me advocating for bartender <laughs> therapy. Go to see a licensed therapist. But I like it. She argues about rules for society with the bartender. And it's just so over the top. Like, she knows it's complete bullshit. Do whatever she wants. Yeah, and nobody bother me. No Spider-Man movies. <laughs> <laughs> no more Spider-Man movies. That's true. There no have more. been a lot. There, Yes. So very many Spider-Man. There's been six in the past 14 years. Oh my gosh, that's a Two lot. Two reboots and a new one coming out next year. Oh my gosh. What is everyone's obsession with Spider-Man? Spider-Man is so cool. Okay, fine. He's the coolest superhero. Okay. On like further investigation, I really liked this conversation between Eleanor and the bartender because it reminded me of Kant's categorical imperatives. Because when the bartender's saying like, well, I can't give you a free drink because if I gave you a free drink, I'd have to give one day like everybody here. And when we were talking about Kant's categorical imperatives back in season one, we were talking about how he believed that there were rules that you must follow regardless of your desires. So if you're doing an action, like giving a free drink to one person, you're saying that everyone should always do it. You're universalizing that action. So Eleanor taking the money from that wallet, right? Automatically, if she does that, she's saying that everybody should always take the money out of a wallet. Mm -hmm. And then we're constantly going to be in this cycle of people stealing money from each other and no one's going to have money. So no stealing. Because then everyone should always steal and society can't function that way. And Kant believe it wasn't fair to make exceptions for yourself. Where Eleanor is saying, well, I should do whatever I want. And everybody should leave me alone. Making an exception for yourself and taking the money because, well, in my world, I say that's what I do. Right? That's not how a functioning society works. It, it can't. I feel like Eleanor is really taking to heart what she learned about Kant from Chidi. Because in that moment, she is treating Fred as an end in her, himself, right? Realizing that we're not all objects that exist to be used by other people, you know? This Fred guy didn't make that money so that Eleanor could just take it. We are our own people with our own desires, goals, beliefs, all these things. And... Can't believe that our autonomy imbues us with this absolute moral worth, so we shouldn't be manipulated by other people, and we shouldn't manipulate other people. And I think that that really spoke to her, because in this moment, she is understanding that Fred is like, he's just like her. He's just some guy who accidentally lost his wallet, and just because Eleanor can steal the money doesn't mean that she should 
at all. I like it. I, I feel like she's recognizing the humanity in another person, which she rarely ever did before. And she's actively choosing not to take advantage or manipulate him. She does that to the bartender. She absolutely does. Because the second she comes in, she's like, it's my birthday. Give me the free drink and stop asking me questions. But then as she's talking to him, realizing, oh, I'm being ridiculous right now. All of these things that I'm saying, I know they're over the top. I know they don't make sense. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can see her kind of fading on that as she's got the wallet. Like even just the way that Kristen Bell is talking, it's like. All of that anger is kind of going away a little bit. And now she's focusing on, oh, now I have this obligation in a way, like this moral obligation to get this thing back to somebody. And she goes on that journey. I think it's really nice. She goes on this journey to give back Mm -hmm. the wallet, which is also kind of her journey, right? Yeah. It's her trip to realizing that she can be better. Yeah. I feel like she's doing right by... By her boy, Kant. Maybe she's a, she's a fan, just like Chidi now. I feel like they did a good job. Yeah, Eleanor's story is really powerful this episode. And she starts to cry when the guy shows her that picture. Oh, It's just like in the in the star with the, the toothbrush holders. Yeah, it was right there. See, she was upset this whole episode. She just was masking over that sadness with anger. When she's in the cab, her facial transformation, when she's talking to the cab driver, Mm -hmm. when she goes from happy to, like, pissed off Mm -hmm. is terrifying. The transition there is, like, completely psychopathic. It's amazing. (laughs) I love it. Like, she's... Oh, yeah. It's... I rewatched that scene so many times and just going from smiling to, like, deadpan anger, it was just... It's really great. Yeah, I feel like Kristen Bell does a very good job in this episode. I feel like everyone's doing a great job, to be honest, but yeah. And we also get that tiny the little hint, you know, from the bartender. Um, so you just take care of yourself and you don't owe anyone anything, mm-hmm. which was nice. What we owe to each other. Yeah, a lot of these bartenders, I don't know. They're like, they're pretty good. <laughs> and there's a little hint about how the world has changed as well. mm you get the comment about how there are no bees anymore because they all died. Yeah. Which is interesting. So I guess in this iteration of reality, they went extinct. Yeah. I mean, they're closed now. So. Mm-hmm. And scary. Eleanor just acknowledging like, yeah. And then when you're sick, you just like beg for money on the internet. It's a perfect system. No, it 100% is not. <laughs> it's the worst system. She knows it's the worst, oh, but she, she's just. She's just pissed. Yep. When Eleanor sees the drawing of the family, she realizes that doing a good thing brings other people happiness Mm. and it feels good, Mm. but not just for her. And that's where I think the key is. It feels good for other people. And she, if she only felt good for doing the good deed, Mm. then we would be Tahani all over again and she would be doing good things for the wrong reasons. But once she realizes that other people get joy or get happiness out of the actions that she's doing that's where the good deed comes yeah for once in her life she's actually making the world a better place yeah not just for her yeah for everyone else i was listening to the good place the podcast and it turns out that a joke from that scene got cut out and i think it's a good thing it did because the impact would have been diminished i think if they had gone through with this joke what they were gonna have is a teenage girl walk down from the stairs and that was going to be the daughter and it was gonna be like oh i thought a five-year-old drew this no i'm just really bad at art (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's funny but yeah the impact would be lessened yeah yeah it's sweet to think of a a young kid who's trying hard to comfort her dad Mm -hmm. because she knows he's scared and she knows it feels bad to feel scared that's sweet i think not that you can't do sweet things when you're a teenager just you know yeah okay so do you know who this leaves this leaves us with this leaves us with chidi chidi experiences an existential crisis 
he wanders into a supermarket, shirtless, and buys over $800 worth of canned chili, peeps, and M&Ms. He cooks a chili candy concoction in class, and he describes the main theories on how to live an ethical life. Virtue ethics, consequentialism, deontology, and nihilism. Okay, so my first note here, and the first note I wrote down in all of these notes was, William Jackson Harper is the shining star of this episode, and I will hear no arguments to the contrary. So even though I've been talking about how great Tahani is in this episode, and how wonderful Kristen Bell did with Eleanor, William Jackson Harper undoubtedly takes the cake here. Oh yeah, he's, he's the so star good. of this episode, and he delivers my favorite line of the episode too. Which is what? My favorite line in the episode is, is there a take a car, leave a car tray? <laughs> No, 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 just take it. Just, <laughs> just take it. Just take it. <laughs> so good. Oh, I just think he's so funny in this episode. I mean, you and I were just cracking up. And it still feels really true to his character. I don't feel like we're breaking him for jokes. I mean, his reaction makes perfect sense. He's been searching for answers his entire career, his entire life, really. And now he's being told that nothing he does matters anymore because the result's always going to be the same. He's just wandering aimlessly through life now yeah nothing he does matters wanders aimlessly looking super jacked super jacked i did not expect him to be that jacked i mean i knew like in season one eleanor talks about him being surprisingly jacked right i just didn't think he would be that that's excessive that's a lot that's i mean excessive. it's not excessive but like he looks really good he's clearly been working out a lot i feel mm -hmm. like chidi didn't know what to do at the gym so he just did everything. Mm. Yeah, he couldn't choose. He couldn't choose a specific workout. Exactly. So he's just like, well, I'll just work out everything. And I'm, I'm sure if his pants came off, he would have like thunder thighs, like in a good way. <laughs> and like calves that would rival calves like of steel. a bicyclist. <laughs> so I read online that... Chidi being asked to put a shirt on in the grocery store is very unlikely in Australia. Really? Yeah. Like, Australians were getting annoyed about it. They were saying, that wouldn't happen. People don't actually care if you're shirtless. Hmm. Which is so bizarre to me because I can't imagine ever going to a grocery store and seeing someone shirtless and that being okay. Yeah. Well, there's signs all over the place that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. Yeah. You got to wear at least flip flops and you got to at least wear one of those tank tops that like muscle dudes at the gym are wearing that like shows most of their and chest. barely hides their nipples. Yeah. I just thought that was funny. And so many people up in arms like, oh, he would all be allowed to be shirtless. I feel like maybe they just really want to see Cheaty without that shirt. That shirt is great, though. Who, what, where, wine? It's a good one. So Chidi paraphrases that quote. The, mm -hmm. the god is dead. Yeah, it's from not the, a completely direct quote. No, from the parable of the madman. Yes, he said, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Who will wipe this blood off us? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? So a lot of people take... This quote from Nietzsche as him celebrating the death of God and being happy that finally we've broken from our the chains of religion. But that wasn't it. It was that nihilism was basically on the rise. Um, and he was arguing that its corrosive effects would eventually destroy all moral, religious, and metaphysical convictions and precipitate the greatest crisis in human history. This wasn't a good thing. So he was trying to, to explain that the death of God was basically going to not only lead to a rejection of a belief, like a religion, um, but also to a rejection of a universal moral law. So then all of a sudden we, if we don't have God, if God's not a thing, if religion is suddenly untrue, then what morals are we supposed to follow? So if we have nothing to believe in, then what's... Yeah, what's mm -hmm. right? And nihilism, of course, with its um, its belief that nothing matters at all and everything is completely inherently pointless, that doesn't exactly leave people feeling like they need to do good things or do anything productive, right? Um, it would 
in his mind, be just the complete downfall of all humankind. So that's kind of how Chidi's feeling at this moment, right? Like, he... He doesn't understand. He has been following these different philosophers for years and years and years, and he truly believes in a lot of what they say, especially as we've seen um, deontology, right? Kant. Now all of a sudden he's finding out, well, none of that matters, actually. And I don't know how to deal with this new and scary universe that I've been thrown into. So I was reading that there's a lot of different branches in nihilism. Mm-hmm. And the one that Chidi seems like he's going through would be the existential nihilism, yes. which is the belief that life has no intrinsic meaning or value mm-hmm. and no single human or every human will change in all of existence. And life is meaningless. Yeah. And that's a very tough thing to go through, right? What's the point in everything? There is no point. And for him to actually understand that there isn't. And I guess you could say that the afterlife isn't the point of life, right? You're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to behave in a certain way in this life on earth just to have a certain result in the afterlife. You isn't that be... what the belief system for Christians, Catholics, do good deeds, get into heaven? Yeah, and that's part of it, I'm sure. Um, but we don't really get the sense that that's what it is for Chidi, right? Like, right. Chidi is not... A religious person he's a philosopher right so a lot of these philosophers didn't necessarily believe in an afterlife mm-hmm. you know they didn't believe in moral desert like they didn't feel like you should get something for behaving a certain way so to me it's a little it's a little bit confusing like chidi could still i feel understand that his actions on earth still do have an effect and he's sh- should still behave in a moral way. And I think that's why Eleanor is able to get him back so quickly is that he had like a momentary, like it's complete a momentary freak, freak out. out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a whole day freak out, but it wasn't, you know, months past and he was just digging a hole on the side of the road just because why not? Right. And everything's pointless. Why don't I just do this? Mm-hmm. I'll just fill it with gummy bears and then make a pool. <laughs> It's interesting. Obviously, like, he talks about virtue ethics and consequentialism and deontology, and these are the main three that we've explored in the show and in this episode, and I feel like that would still mean something to him. Despite knowing that he goes to the bad place, it's not like life on Earth has no point at all. Because even if you end up in the bad place, even if most people you meet on Earth end up going to the bad place. If you act like Chidi has been acting for the rest of your life, you're never going to do anything good, right? You're just going to flit around. And why not, like Eleanor says, why not try to do good while you're here? At least for other people. Yeah. At least for them. At least for the goodness of the world in general. Even Mm -hmm. if there's nothing that happens when we die, why not at least do something good while you're here? And that's why Chidi was, like you said, it was so easy for him to go back. Yeah, to with, take him back from the right. brink. It's just the idea of nihilism was so easy to grasp onto mm-hmm. as soon as he heard all this. It's just like, you know what? Everything is pointless. Nothing matters. And then he just kind of pushed everything aside Yeah. until, you know, you're brought back to reality. Like, hey, this isn't going to work. Yeah. <laughs> for anybody, including and, you. And I've got a better way that you can live out your life. Yeah, and you know it's a better way. You yeah. just the ideal the idea of not caring about anything is kind of sweet. It's almost like Yeah. And we've already seen an existential crisis in Michael, and Michael as well, it was fairly easy for him to come back from that too after he'd had a conversation with Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of nice. Eleanor is always bringing people back from the brink. And when he was talking about an existential crisis last season, he described it as an anguish when people contemplate the silent indifference of our universe and a realization that the world is absurd and that absurdity needs to be confronted. And... You know, he's not really doing the greatest job at confronting that in this No, episode. he's not. He's, he's pushing it aside. Yeah, he's he's absolutely um, feeling this anguish 
the silent indifference of of this planet of um his actions like it doesn't really mean anything because everybody's gonna die eventually the human race will be gone blah 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 it's all sad stuff to think about but you gotta live a little bit in the moment (laughs) you gotta confront that absurdity and i'm glad that eleanor was there to help him so then of course he says to his students he's gonna teach them the meaning of life here are the three main theories and he quotes um virtue ethics So we've talked about virtue ethics a little bit before. He says, Aristotle believed there were certain virtues of mind and character like courage and generosity and that you should try to develop yourself in accordance with these virtues. And virtue ethics is kind of the show. Like that's, that's their philosophy, I think. That if we can become good people, then we will do the right thing effortlessly. There's no rule book needed. Like Michael believes that Chidi can teach all of them and in turn be taught to be good people. And then this is going to influence their actions until they're eventually just able to do good things without even trying. Michael is not trying to set up all these little scenarios so that Eleanor is tested to do the right thing here or Jason is tested to do the right thing. He thinks that by them becoming more morally conscious people, that that will lead them to do good actions. Yeah, and if only he had figured that out last episode when he was snow plowing everything out of the way right yeah give him a chance to test out flex out those moral muscles exactly Ooh, moral muscles that's what chidi has so many of them it's the episode title chidi's moral muscles yeah that's the episode title um what do you think about that do you agree that this show's philosophy lines up with virtue ethics i think that's been the whole point is Not having all these different scenarios like, oh, Eleanor found a wallet. I wonder what she'll do with it. It's just them getting all the knowledge that they can absorb from Chidi and just seeing what they can do with it and just live their life better. And knowledge is power, guys. Yeah. And I think what's the it's important to see the difference between approaching a scenario approaching a scenario where scenario (laughs) Excuse moi. Approaching a scenario and thinking, what is the what is the appropriate response to this situation? Yeah. Instead of coming up to a situation and just knowing intrinsically because of all the wealth of knowledge that you've learned and all the the teachings and and just knowing without even thinking about it what the quote unquote right thing to do would be. Yeah. And just instead of having to sit there and think, well. What's morally correct instead mm-hmm. of like, I know this is right and I know this is wrong and just doing it. I just know. Yeah. Like yeah, at that point, I'm, I'm a good enough person that I know it in my gut what the right thing to do is. And people can't think that they're just going to know things without learning or without studying or without, mm-hmm. you know, uh, involving themselves in the world. Right. So what you think may be right could just be you not understanding how the world works Mm -hmm. or how things work or how people work and not being open to understanding it too right right? closing yourself off from knowledge because because you don't want to learn uncomfortable or it's it's something new or difficult sure there's there's growth that happens throughout your life and i think that we all just need to be open to becoming better people anyway back to chidi and then we get deontology which of course was chidi's favorite um i really feel like that one you know just being ethical is simply identifying and obeying those duties and following those rules that's definitely closest to chidi's moral reasoning like (laughs) he was saying there are things that people shouldn't do like murdering like when he accidentally helped to kill janet in season one and things like lying like lying about killing janet in season one (laughs) all these moments where you can see that he was he was trying so hard to hold on to those rules and now the rules are out the window and that is why he is struggling now with his little existential nihilistic breakdown (laughs) i don't know chidi's got proof though like he's got proof that there's an afterlife and that our actions on earth actually matter like in a tangible way there are points to each action we do it's just 
now that he knows that there's no reason for him to live an ethical life, I don't feel like he should just throw it all out the window. Um, I get it, though. He's struggling because he's not what a lot of people would consider a bad person. Um, and there was a really interesting, actually, conversation on Twitter about this. Um, I will retweet Lonnie Diane Rich's tweet um, about Chidi and his anxiety and how he shouldn't be in the bad place. Very interesting conversation. Um, I just... I'm glad that we didn't do it for too long. I'm glad that Chidi didn't just stay in that hole. We got him out by the end of the episode. I think that's good. We got a lot of fun stuff with Chidi's chili crisis. You know, the whole thing was great. But I'm glad we're not wallowing. Well, the the conversation that you're referencing, was that about um, Chidi's, how his indecision should not lead him to the bad place? Yes. So... I totally agree, but I think it's the fact that his indecisions impacted other people in such a way that negatively affected their lives. Mm. So it was almost like him deciding to not decide or his indecisions, whatever, hurt people. And that's what got him into the bad place. Not that he couldn't decide, it's just that he inadvertently hurt people whether he knew it or not it doesn't it didn't matter and i right. think that's why this part of why the system sucks because that should matter right it's the whole intent versus impact exactly yeah so that was just my thoughts on that whole conversation i just have another little thing to add that i didn't get to add on twitter i just think that part of the issue is that because Chidi had such difficulty making any choice that he didn't really make that many good choices either. Like, it wasn't as though he made a bunch of bad choices. He just didn't get a chance to do a lot of the good things, maybe, because he still had difficulty with them, with actually doing the thing, just making the choice to do that thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that he's a professor. We know that he's helping Eleanor and... Jason Tahani. However, he's also getting a lot out of that. It's not selfless. It was before um, the study began, but it's not anymore. So his inability to decide left him without deciding to do any good. Yeah, it in left a lot him, of situations. You know, it left him doing neutral things, I sure. suppose. Okay. So let's get out of philosophy for a second. Sure. And let's go back to cheating the grocery store because oh there's God. some background stuff that I wanted to talk about. Ooh. So he's, I'm picturing the scene. He's in a, okay. he's in the shopping, he's in the grocery store. He's very muscly. He's yeah. shirtless. Yeah. He's just being <laughs> uh, like Eleanor in season one, dumping all the stuff into his cart. Oh, I love that. That was reckless such a great abandon. Parallel. Um. Also, peeps are gross. Disgusting. One hundred percent. Marshmallow candy is gross. Sorry and... for people who like them. I'm just wrong. <laughs> I guess they're not Australian either, so they had to put them in the the ethnic or the import aisle. Ah. Uh. So when Chidi's putting on his shirt, on the shelf next to him are super cliche Australian items. Oh. That should not be together, but they are, because why not? They're probably like, okay, let's just put a bunch of stereotypical things. There's Vegemite. Right. There's stuffed koalas and kangaroos. <laughs> There's your typical Outback hats. Okay. And there's Nestle Milo, which is a chocolate and malt powder you mix with hot water. There's Billy Tea, which is Australia's favorite strong bush cuppa. No. Oh. Now, bu- a Billy Tea, I had to look this up. Uh, it's tea the Aud- Australians brew in a billy can or a tin can with a wire handle. And you swing it around while you're out camping in the woods. You swing this can around with your arm to get the tea leaves to settle on the bottom. What? Yeah. How does the tea not fly out? Just like oh, science? Just, Physics? Yeah. It's oh, okay, when cool. you swing like... I feel like the first swing, though, you're definitely getting splashed with no, some you hot gotta, water. No, you gotta... You just All give right. her. Okay. And uh, it's an outdoor tradition, as the early settlers used to do it that way. Oh. So okay. it's kind of neat. Along with the items that Chidi is buying, which you did not mention. I know, almond milk. So much almond milk. And a whole took... container of almonds. I loved that. 
<laughs> like from the little good. little dispenser. She didn't charge him for that. I don't think so. No. But he would be doomed for all eternity <laughs> if he wasn't already. <laughs> he just lost a bunch of points there, but really doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And then we have Chidi's song. Yeah, it's so good. It was stuck in my head for like three days after that. You put the peeps in the chili pot and eat them both up. You put the peeps in the chili pot and add the m and You put the peeps in the chili pot and makes it taste bad. I like how he says bad. It's just bad. <laughs> and Chidi's line, his answer to, is that going to be on the test, is my second favorite line, mm. which is, Yes and no, and you all get A's or F's, and there is no test, and you all failed it, and you all got A's. Who cares? Goodbye. Yeah. Oh, he's really, honestly, he needs an Emmy for this episode. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of our episode. Eleanor confronts Chidi and brings him to Michael and Janet. Tahani and Jason arrive, and all six agree to Eleanor's plans to do good and help other people get into the good place. Hashtag Soul Squad. Soul Squad. We're uh, we're upgrading from Team Cockroach to Soul Squad. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good upgrade. Yeah. Team Cockroach to Brainy Bunch to Soul Squad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it. Now, before we get into analyzing the last bit, mm-hmm. there's a newspaper headline behind Jason. Oh, yeah? That was super confusing to me, and it just <laughs> it just read as... Australian gibberish to me. Mm-hmm. It was Biffo Blotto Bludger turns tall poppy with Fazo Frothy Biz. What? <laughs> it took me like 15 to 20 minutes to try and translate this. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, roughly translated, it means that a violent drunk slacker or layabout or a loafer becomes highly successful with a wonderful beer business. <laughs> what? Oh, that's great. I yeah, love Australian so, like, slang. I know. A biffo blotto bludger would be like uh, a violent, which is the biffo. The blotto would be like a drunk. And then a bludger, I guess, is like a slacker and layabout or a loafer. Okay. And I thought bludgers were just things in Quidditch. Yeah. So. Who would have thunk it? Hmm. Yeah. And uh, turns tall poppy is successful. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And Fazo Look at that is, tall poppy. <laughs> yeah, Fazo is wonderful, and frothy would be beer. Going down to the the pub to get a frothy. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I thought it was just gibberish, like with a bunch of alliteration there. But yeah, it actually meant something. Okay, good stuff. Kudos, mm-hmm. prop department. So. Eleanor and Tahani are kind of like mind melding here because they're both trying to be virtuous for virtue's sake. And I like that. I mean, obviously she knows that none of this is going to uh, give them any moral dessert, but she still wants to do it anyway. And at the end of the day, maybe that's the only thing that can really help them. Finally Mm -hmm. knowing that their points don't matter. But still choosing to do good. Still choosing to do good. And that's probably the case they're going to plead in the mm-hmm. future yeah, probably. to the judge or to whoever's in charge or something mm-hmm. that even with the knowledge of eternal damnation, they still chose to do good mm-hmm. for other people, not yeah. for their own sake. Right. Yeah. I, I'm wondering how the rest of the season is going to pan out now. Um, it just keeps happening that way, right? I know. Just every keep... episode is like, Oh, what are they going to do now? What are they going to do now? I, I'm intrigued. Maybe like this, ballad of donkey doug right the next episode maybe that will be jason trying to help donkey doug somehow like help save his soul it just seems interesting are they gonna have the rest of the season dedicated to them trying to help people maybe i don't know we'll see yeah i mean if anyone could do it the Mm -hmm. show could do it what's gonna happen to simone and chidi now is she going to learn all this information? Because that would be awful of anybody to do. Yep. You can't damn her. She would definitely get into the good place. Well, maybe not. Because it really does seem like it's basically impossible. But she's so cute. <laughs> and she's so smart. And nice. Anyway. When Janet finds out that Jason and Tahani got married, 
Her, mm-hmm. She's crushed. Mm-hmm. She's so sad. But she feels better when yes. it's platonic. It's okay. Strictly platonic. I'm hoping they become a thing again. Yeah. And then when Michael sees Eleanor and Chidi and Jason and Tahani, like when he sees them all come into the office, he's so excited. Like, oh my gosh, you guys, you came back to hang out with us. Like mm-hmm. you came back with us. And, and you didn't have to do that. No, he's he's so happy to see his friends. Aww. Yeah. And they're all choosing to be together and do good things together. It yeah. warms his demon heart. Yeah. <laughs> His cold, non-existent heart. Yeah, and when yeah. and when they're talking about the four of us, or the four of them, and then Eleanor says, well, the six of us, actually. Hmm. Michael's so excited there, too. Like, he's just so happy to be included, and he's just so genuine now. Like, just to see his facial expressions, hmm. and there were so many moments in season one and two when we were, well, not season one, but in season two when we were kind of unsure about his loyalties, but I think we're... There's been no issues, no qualms, Mm -mm. no doubts. No, none at all. He loves them very much. These four humans are the only thing that matter to him. Mm -hmm. And Janet. Okay, so that's quite the episode. The credits? Do you want to talk about the credits? Those Mm -hmm. wacky, crazy credits? What would happen in the credits? The names were all weird and bizarre. So we had... Keith Kerbin, oh which is, God. of course, Keith Urban. He's from New Zealand, but his wife is Australian. Mm. His wife is Nicole Kidman. Mm. Uh, although she was born in Hawaii, but she was she moved with her parents back to Australia when she was four. I, I didn't believe. realize that Keith Urban was from New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then there was Kat Pash, who is actually... Pat Cash. They did a lot of switching the first letters. Mm. And Pat Cash is an Australian tennis player. Hmm. Then there was Gel Mibson, which oh is, of God. course, Mel Gibson, who is, as we all know, an actor, film director, etc. But how is he related to Australia? He's Australian. Really? I thought Mel Gibson was just... Ugh. No. That's why okay. in Mad Max was actually in... Australian movie completely filmed in Australia and everybody in it was Australian so it's technically not a... I didn't even know that Mel Gibson was in Mad Max so all I know is he wow. did like what women want and I kind of love that movie even though it's terrible like I know <laughs> objectively I 100% know it's terrible and I know that Mel Gibson is a terrible person still kind of like that movie it's like a guilty pleasure yeah it sucks because he's done some good movies yeah but and then there was Miley Kinogue which is, of course, Kylie Minogue. Oh, my gosh. And there was Laud Raver, who is Rod Laver, who is another tennis player. Mm. Then there was Mark Supiel. Oh, my God. Which is just Mark Supiel. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there was um, Nicole Mankid, which is just... No! <laughs> Nicole Kidman. No, Nicole Mankid. That's yeah. great. And then there was Javon Ulagong, who is Yvonne Gulagong who is also a tennis player. Hmm. And finally, Wyoming Nats, oh, who is, of course, God. Naomi Watts, oh my God. Australian actress. Hmm. So they had a lot of fun with those name swaps, and I did definitely have to look up some of those people, like Pat Cash and... The tennis players. The I'm tennis guessing. players, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I especially like the name, the uh, Ivan Gulagong. Really interesting. Good name. Yeah. You know, sounds like somebody like that. sounds like somebody Tahani would name drop. Ooh, yeah, kind of. All right. So that was our episode. What did you think overall? Best episode of the season. Definitely. Definitely. I agree with you. Top five of the show. Yeah. I really like every character's presence in it. Mm-hmm. Chidi, easily a highlight. 100%. He's so good. Yeah. So funny. So I'm kind of hoping for episodes like that for every character at some point. Hmm. Okay. Whether Not... the obvious star. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So shall we get to our mailbag? All right. We have mail. You, you put, put the, the mail in the mailbag and read them both up. up. You, you put, put the mail in the mailbag and add the conversation. conversation. You, you put, put the mail in the mailbag and makes it taste debatable. debatable. All right, so our first message comes from Daryl at 
Kali underscore 97 on Twitter. Daryl said, I really liked Eleanor's speech at the end about doing good things for others, because even though they might not have a chance of getting in the good place, other people still have that chance and they should at least try. I just feel like that was important. Like something all the characters are learning this season. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I feel like it is a really important lesson for them to learn that just because they're at this moment doomed, that doesn't mean all of humanity is doomed. And it doesn't mean that they can't still do good things on Earth while they're here. Yeah, it would be super selfish of them to just take that information and just not do anything with their life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a huge step forward for all of them. So I'm very impressed. Thank you, Daryl. Our second message comes from Sierra at Callus underscore strange which, by the way, I love that uh, that Twitter handle. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the age-old debate about what constitutes a pure motive to do good. The good place definitely says that doing good to be viewed as good by others is bad. Sort of like Tahani. But doing good to feel good about yourself is fine, right? Sometimes people say, it was more a gift for myself because I felt so good making or giving it, but that doesn't mean it's not a good action. However, are those actions less good than truly self-sacrificing actions that involve a lot of pain? Take spending your life taking care of someone else because you feel like it's your duty. Interesting. I think maybe it depends when you feel good. When you feel? Okay. Yeah, like if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to give to this charity because I'm going to feel good afterwards, then that's totally different than... I gave to this charity and now I feel good about it. I think I feel those... good about my contribution. Right. I feel like that there's a, a definite, like there's clearly a difference there. Mm. There has to be. Yeah. That's doing something because you know you're going to feel good afterwards versus doing something and then feeling good. Okay. So your intent here is, is what's... It's clearly yeah. intent. Yeah. Okay. So your I want motive... to feel good. So I'm going to donate some money to this homeless person. Right. Instead That'll make of, me feel better. Right. Instead of, I'm giving this homeless guy some money, and now I feel good about it. Mm. Okay. So the sequence of emotion? Sure. Okay. Yeah, because your motive here would still be pure just to, to do good in the world. And then, by consequence of that, you end up feeling pretty good. So as soon as you start to think, ooh, am I going to feel good about this? That's where the bad intention comes. Or the wrong intention. Right. Because something like you suggested, Sierra, um, with with actions that involve a lot of pain, like spending your life taking care of someone because you feel it's your duty, maybe you do feel good about that. Maybe, yeah, it brings you a lot of pain because perhaps you're taking care of someone who's sick and elderly and that takes away from your personal life. But maybe you feel a sense of accomplishment or satisfaction in having done that you feel good because you helped someone that you care about so that in itself I don't think is necessarily pure I don't know I I think you've got a really good point Jason like are you doing it so that you will feel better about yourself or so that it will get you something good out of life like Tahani with all the attention and um oh she's such a good person because she looked after her grandmother or whatever exactly or are you doing it just so that you can do good in the world and then by consequence of that feeling you know happy with yourself i don't remember the exact scripture but i know it was i mean something that jesus said is the best charities or or the best deeds are ones that you don't tell anybody about right you just you don't do it for other people Right. And that's that's a whole issue in our society right now. Like people taking videos and posting it online when they do a good thing. Right. Oh, watch me feed this homeless guy here. I'm. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Or watch. Look, my friend gave money to this woman who didn't have gas money. Like you're doing that. But then you're posting it on Reddit and getting all these comments about how you're such an amazing person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's nice to see people doing good things in the world. But why are you doing it? Are you doing it so that you can post about it later and then feel some self-righteous... Yeah, look how many clicks I got. Look how many likes I got. Yeah, look at how great I'm a person. Here it is measured in literal retweets and likes or whatever. Yeah. Or are you just doing it because you wanted to do that? 
you know, it's, it's a very weird thing that I'm seeing now and I'm not loving it. Like I remember listening to an episode of a podcast and I can't remember which one it is now. Um, but where Kristen Bell was saying, just go like, go do something good and don't tell anyone about it. Just do it. All right. Thank you, Sierra. We got a message from Anna at Anna underscore MCG on Twitter. Um, she said, so now that the humans know about the afterlife, they can accrue points because they know what waits for them. And that means their intentions are tainted. But in the certainty that they are doomed, any good that they do in spite of that is just as pure as if they hadn't ever known about the good place or bad place. I think their plan going forward to do as much good as they can actually will get them into the good place. I agree. I think it's more pure now that they know that they're screwed, that they yeah. can't accrue points anymore. And none of it matters. I think it makes it even more meaningful that they do good. Because before it was always a possibility. Right. Then maybe that makes it just makes it better. Yeah. Maybe this will solve like it seems to have solved Tahani's issues with motivation. Maybe this will solve Chidi's issues with making decisions. Obviously, that has somehow already begun to solve Eleanor's issue issue with selfishness. But what about Jason? That's what I'm wondering. Does he is he suddenly just going to become more knowledgeable because now he knows he'll be in the bad? Place? Yeah, I think there's going to be more to Jason for the rest of the season because okay. there's clearly a lacking of his understanding and his reactions this episode right now maybe we just discovered the whole solution to the whole problem Mm. of people being good we should just be told by the good place and just tell everybody you know what guys there's a good place there's a bad place unfortunately they're full nobody can get in nothing you do on earth is going to make a difference for you getting in so have a nice day, have a nice life, and then maybe people will just either mass panic or, <laughs> or literally nihilism will take over. Or this is people will just start nightmare. doing good. <laughs> okay, maybe we just discovered the worst possible scenario. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> just a mass megaphone over the planet Earth. Like, hey guys. Yeah, so this exists, but you're not getting in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I don't think it would go well. <laughs> anyway, thanks for your, your message. Yes, thank you, Anna. All right, thank you for your messages. Please keep them coming as episodes roll out. Um, We will finally be able to watch The Ballad of Donkey Doug, so please send us those. We will be recording quite soon for that episode, so get them in if you want your questions or thoughts addressed. That brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes, because this is the best way for others to find the show. And it makes my heart happy. Honestly, that's like a good thing you can do in the world. Like, that'll bump up your points. So if you're listening and you want to make... I very manipulative right now. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. You can do what you want. I just, I'm just saying that I wholeheartedly appreciate when we get a review or a note. It's really nice to know that um, people are enjoying the show. Yeah. So if you're listening right now and you haven't dropped us a little message on iTunes or sent us a little email, no time like the present. Yeah. We might call you out. We might not. I mean, we don't have to. (laughs) If you don't want us to, but we still like reading them. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. And we're on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. We're also on YouTube. You can just search for Multiverse Radio. And you can always email us from our website, www.multiverseradio.ca, because we're in Canada, A. Eh? And I'm never going to stop making that joke, because I love it. It gets funnier every time, eh? Yeah, I really see you laughing so hard right now. Oh, yeah. Eh? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> and you one put of my the cheap <laughs> peeps in the chili pot. And oh my god. Eat them both up. You put the cheeps in the pillow pot. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> the cheeps in the billy pot. <laughs> no, you're not liking my song? Come on! I'm trying to formulate a sentence here. It's a bop! We're bopping. I'm 
we're changing the radio station. <laughs> oh, harsh. Okay. Hey there, buddy. Feeling kind of empty, like there's a gaping chasm in your soul, a tumbleweed blowing aimlessly through a vast desert of nothingness. Mm-hmm. You think that nothing we do matters, right? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Life isn't meaningless, and you are the very proof of that. I used to feel the way you feel right now, but it turns out everything we did on Earth mattered. In fact, actions had an actual point value. So life had a tangible meaning, which means that you don't have to feel this way anymore, buddy. Existential crisis solved.